My wife got this digital picture frame, uh, and she loves it. People send pictures to it. I'm thinking about sending her messages. Uh, there are places in her house I can leave notes to her. We just recently had a little debacle over our toaster. Uh, she got rid of it, and I realized one night I couldn't make toast. And you know it's bad when you're the guy and you can't make toast. You know, people say, well, at least he can make toast. I can't make toast. I have no toaster. So I put a little note, I need a toaster. I was thinking about taking a picture of the note and sending it to her picture frame so she could see it. I need a toaster. I, I got up the next day and there was a note by my note that said, I ordered you a toaster. <laughs> It'll be here when it, and it came. We, we now have a toaster. So we've reached the 21st century. That's, that's really good. But one of my, my, one of my sisters-in-law took a picture of her daughter, Kate. She's little. And she's wearing these really goofy glasses. And, and I don't know if the way the frame is, we don't have enough pictures on it, but at a certain time of night, the same picture comes up on the frame. So usually she's already gone to bed and I'm up and if I turn a light on, then the picture frame comes up and up comes this picture of our niece wearing these goofy glasses. And I was thinking, you know, it'd be fun to have a pair of glasses that way. Kids often have things that I wish I had. I, you know, they're, sometimes their outfits are nicer. Sometimes they're there, the things like this would be nice to have a kind of a funky pair of glasses. I don't know, even know where you would buy a pair like that for adults. I do have glasses. I don't wear them very often, uh, mostly for driving. If I'm going to watch something, um, if I'm at a program or, or at a, uh, someone is speaking and I want to see the speaker, then I'm going to take them along. If I remember, uh, I don't know if you've ever been through the process of getting your eyes checked it's really kind of an ordeal. You sit down, they've got these, and I'm not talking about dilation now, that's, that's much worse. I'm just saying just they have these kind of weird glasses they put on your head, and they have all these little levers on the side, and, and they say, you know, read the numbers or letters on the screen in front of you, and then they go, they, they flip a lever, is that better, is that worse, how about this one, how about that one, and, and it's just trial and error, and then finally the doctors, you know, he or she's writing everything down and, and says, okay, this is your prescription. You send it off to a company in China. And then six weeks later, you have 10 pair uh, of glasses for about 50 bucks um, that are all different colors. Uh, not nice ones like my niece, but, but nice enough. And they have your prescription on it. And, and then you put them on your head and everything becomes clear. And we're living in a world where people think that they can see everything in focus. They think they understand the meaning of life. They, they believe they understand what their goals and purposes ought to be or how life should be lived. We call this a worldview because they say that they can see the world clearly. But for the vast majority of them, I'm going to tell you, it's a blurry mess because they have never seen life through God's glasses. In fact, I don't know if you've ever thought about this. This is one of the ways that God describes unsaved people. He describes them as being spiritually blind. In fact, the passage that I had uh, Kip read earlier is this whole section is dealing with how God solves the problem of spiritual blindness. Paul says, if our gospel be hidden, it is hidden to them who are lost, whom the God of this world has blinded their eyes so that they would not believe the truth. They're incapable of seeing what is really there because they're spiritually blind. They need God's glasses. And what I want to do for the next half hour, a little longer than that maybe, is explain the spiritual glasses you need to see things as they are. And these spiritual glasses are called faith. So let's begin. What faith is. Fundamentally, faith is trust. Look again at verse 1. Faith 
is the substance. It is the evidence. Now, substance means a firm belief. The term has a wide range of meaning. It can mean something like the foundation of a building, like a substructure. It can also mean something that has actual existence, not a metaphor, but a real being. In Hebrews chapter 1, for example, the writer of Hebrews, we call him the preacher. He says Jesus is described as the express image of God the Father. He is the substance. And in this case, I think it means having a firmness or a courageous resolution. This is how the term is used back in chapter 3 in verse 14, where the preacher says, we are made partakers of Christ. If we hold the beginning of our confidence, that's our word for substance, our confidence steadfast to the end. So I would say it this way. Faith is to firmly believe in something. Now, evidence means similarly to have a strong conviction. And in this case, I think the preacher is referring back to chapter 10 and verse 36. If you look just back a few verses, he writes, For you have need of patience, that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come, will come, and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. What I think is happening here is the preacher here, the, the speaker of Hebrews, is referring back to this idea of a promise. He calls it the promise there in verse 36. This is the very thing in which we believe, verse 39. We don't draw back. We believe to the saving of our soul. We believe in the what? In the promise. So our faith is attached to what we call this promise. And if you see this idea of promise, it's all throughout chapter 11. Verse 9, Abraham journeyed in the land of promise. Look at verse 13. The offspring of Abraham, spiritual offspring, died not having received the promises. In verse 17, Abraham offered up Isaac because he was convinced of the promises. He believed God could literally raise Isaac from the dead. Verse 19, that's the promise of God. Verse 33, the Old Testament saints obtained promises from God. They were given promises. In verse 39, even so, they still had not received the promise. So if you start in verse chapter 10 and verse 36, you're going to get this idea of promise, and it's all throughout this section. And these Old Testament saints, if you understand the promise is the thing that's out there, it's the thing that they believed in. They believed in that God had promised them something, that those promises were true, and that's the thing in which they had conviction, our word evidence. So the idea of trust, of faith, it is a firm belief or a strong conviction in something. In our case, I would say in God. Because Christian faith, let her be, is trust in something presently intangible. That is, I can't touch it with my hands. Look at verse 11 again. Faith is the substance, or the evidence, of things hoped for, of things I cannot see. Faith hopes in something that cannot be proven by my human senses. Now, I have five of them, right? My wife has six, <laughs> right? Isn't that right? Intuition. We have, we have five senses. I can touch things. I can smell things sometimes. I can, I can hear. I can taste. I can see. I still have most of my faculties. I don't have them as well as I used to, but I still have most of them, all right? 
This, what he's talking about, has nothing to do with the five senses. In this case, I would say it is not scientific. Because I don't know how you learned the scientific method. But as I learned the scientific method, it all involves observation. It, it involves being able to use my senses to observe something. Scientist has in his lab, you know, a little, a little critter of some kind. He, or he has in a Petri dish some sort of, of, of spread of some sort of bacteria he's watching grow, right? He's observing. He, he's actually using his senses and he's testing, right? He's throwing theories at this, uh, this thing, trying to figure it out. Or maybe he's looking... Even under a microscope, it's something you can't see without a microscope, but it's still something visible. You could see it if you had eyes that were that good. That's not what we're talking about. Faith has to do with things hoped for that cannot be seen. So I would say it this way. <clears throat> Hope is real yet unreal. And what I mean by that is it's real in that the object hoped for is real. But it's unreal in that it has not yet been realized. Hope is the full expression of faith because it commits a believer, a believer, I use that word on purpose, not Christian, a believer to something that has not yet occurred, but he believes it will occur nonetheless. He's so convinced it will happen, he's actually living as if it already has. Now I'm going to tell you there are people who who invest in Bitcoin this way, that's a bad idea. You know, it's going to hit 100,000. I believe it. And then it drops to 30,000. You lose your shirt. That's not good. This is, this idea of hope, this is what it means to believe a promise. Faith is hope, but not all hope is faith. I say it this way. Hope is always faith pointed in a direction, right? I mean, I believe that Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt. I wasn't there, but I believe that it happened. That's faith. I believe it. It's faith. It's in the past. I believe Jesus was born in Bethlehem. And, and not because I was there. I wasn't there. That was thousands of years ago. That's faith. But I also believe that Jesus is going to return. That's hope. And so it's my faith, and I'm pointing that faith in a, in a particular direction. I'm looking forward to something. You say X will occur, whatever it is, and you hope that it will. It's not yet happened, but you have a belief that it will nonetheless. Let me give you a human example. A few weeks ago, standing outside Melanie and Jason's wedding and watching the rain pour down on an outdoor wedding. It's pouring sheets of rain. It was, it was so wet. There was a, a large lake that was developing right where they were supposed to stand about an hour later. I'm looking at this little lake that's forming. There are now tadpoles swimming around in this lake, right? And I have my app open, and it's the weather app that my wife swears this is the best one on the planet, okay? And I've got it open, and the weatherman says it's going to stop raining at 6.15. Wedding's at 7. And along comes up to me one of, the, one of the guys who works at the venue, and he said, do you want me to start setting out the chairs? And I'm looking at him. Do you have you seen outside? It's pouring down rain. No, I don't want you to set up the chairs. I want you to wait till 6.15. And he's thinking, well, that's very specific, 6.15. And I'm looking at him. That's when the weatherman says it's going to stop raining. Now, it did stop raining about 6.14, and it didn't rain again. The weatherman was right. There's a little bit of a problem with this idea, of course, because even though I hoped it would stop raining and I put my trust in the weatherman, the weatherman isn't perfect, and we all know that. I mean, you've had an outing ruined because the weatherman said it was going to be sunny and 75, and it was raining in 53, or it was, or it was uh, sunny and 95. You, we've had those kinds of experiences, and I'm using extreme examples. I mean, I've, I've had golf outings ruined and, and uh, outdoorsy trips ruined. And I'm going to tell you, I'm not hiking in the rain I, ever. That's just never going to happen. Some of you are so outdoorsy, you don't care. I lived outside for six consecutive months. I don't want to do that anymore. I've done that in my life. 
Okay, never going to do that again. In this case, you say, I'm hoping it doesn't rain. The weatherman says it won't rain. But that's still not biblical hope. That's still not Christian hope. But it gives you an idea of what hope's like. Because I'm believing something that has not yet occurred. So faith is hope. And it's hope in something I can't perceive naturally. I can't see it at all. And, and it's not because I have a problem with my human eyes. My eyes work okay, especially when I get glasses, right? They work really well. It's because the things that I hope for can never be seen by human eyes. It's impossible to see it that way. And this is really important because if you understand this then, that the things in which I am hoping can never be seen by my human eyes, can't be touched, can't be heard, can't be tasted, can't be smelled. My senses cannot observe those things. Then you need to understand that my faith violates the foundational worldview of modernity. Modern people look at that and say, that's crazy. When I explain to people what I believe will happen in the future, do you know to them it sounds like science fiction? You're, you're saying that there's this Jesus, he was here, he died on a cross, rose from the dead, he went to heaven. He's coming back? He's going to set up a kingdom on earth? You're going to be ruling and reigning with him on earth? And then there's going to be this battle and after a thousand years, and then, and then there'll just be eternity, and then there's a, and then this heaven will come down to earth, and it's and it's this beautiful place with streets of gold so pure that it's crystal clear. You're saying, and there are people there. They don't they don't have their bodies yet, but they're there. And you're going to get this new body, and you start talking about old bodies and new bodies and disembodied spirits and all that kind of thing, and they just go science fiction. Because none of that is observable on this side of it. I can't see it. You see, the foundational worldview of all the people who live, your neighbors, your co-workers, the person you buy bread from, and you ought to have a bread man. I mean, I'm just a firm believer in that. You need a bread man. You probably need a cheese man. We don't have those anymore, but you know, you need a good bread man. So the people you buy your bread from, the people you, you interact with, those people, this is how they think. They look at you and think, this is crazy, because their entire worldview is based on, modernity is based on what I can see and touch and feel. The foundational worldview of Western civilization is naturalism. Listen to what Carl Sagan wrote. Quote, the universe is all that is ever was or ever will be, end quote. Or I like how C.S. Lewis describes naturalism. He describes it as the whole show, everything, whatever there is. And I don't know if you've ever thought about what people believe or how they look at life, but the impact of naturalism is profound because naturalism believes that nature is characterized by uniformity. It is deterministic. You, you almost can't control your own destiny. It determines it for you. It's materialistic. It's something I can touch and feel. And it's self-explanatory, which is why naturalism rejects the miracles of the Bible. When naturalism became the prevailing worldview at the end of the 19th century and into the 20th century, when this was the prevailing weather worldview in, in Western civilization, this is why many people who claim to believe the Bible began cutting out all the miracles in the New Testament. It can't be. A miracle goes against naturalism because you can't see it, touch it, feel it. It's not deterministic. It's not self-explanatory. It's not uniform. Blind people just don't start seeing all of a sudden when someone says, be healed. People who can't walk and have never walked in their whole life don't get up and leap and run and praise God when someone says, pick up your bed and walk. That doesn't happen. And it's never been in the history of the world that someone said, Lazarus, come forth. And after three days, a man walked out of a grave. 
But the Bible teaches that. Which is ultimately why naturalism rejects creationism. Naturalism must believe in human evolution. And I'm going to tell you, this is how far our world has come. If I ran for political office and I stood up and I was asked and I stood up and said, I believe that evolution is false, I would lose most of the vote. They would say he's nuts. This guy's crazy. He, what schools did he go to? I, I reject evolution. I actually look at evolution and say, that's crazy. But naturalism believes it. Naturalism actually says, I am not making this up, that you and I came from monkeys. Now, I had little children. I see what little children can do, but they, they're not monkeys. Okay. There are actually some things that monkeys can do. I wish I could do if that were true. You know, they have incredible strength. You, you start looking at all of the way that nature, that God's creation functions, how it, how it re relates to each other. I mean, a giraffe, when he bends down to drink water from a brook, how does his head not just shoot off of his body? His heart is so large, it has to beat so strong to get blood up to that brain of his? Well, scientists tell us that because there's something in the giraffe's neck that closes off the blood supply, and then he would just faint and fall over and be easy prey. Oh, no, but his brain is like a sponge, and it kind of soaks up the blood, so when he, he bends over, he's able to drink from the brook. It's amazing. And it just happened that way. Given enough time, given enough mutations, and it just happened that way. And my friends, that's what people believe. That's what some Christian people believe. I reject humanism. I reject modernism. I don't think science has the answer to man's questions. I, I completely reject postmodernism. Postmodernism is how you get things like there's a great interview on YouTube you can watch. A, a man interviewing students at the University of Washington saying to one young lady, he tells her he's a six foot nine Chinese woman. He's about a 5'10 white man. But he's, she goes, if you want to be that, that's fine. You can't just be a 6'9 Chinese woman if you're a 5'10 white man. It just doesn't work like that. That's what postmodernism said. That's what relativism said. And did you know there are no relativistic pilots? Because everything that goes up a pilot knows has to come back down. Nobody takes their prescription medicine in a relativistic way. Well, whatever's good for you is good for you. Whatever's good for me is good for me. He says, only take one pill. Don't take, don't take five in one day or you might die. <laughs> Here, I'll just chug the bottle. Nobody does that. Read the instructions. And I certainly reject the new modernism, the new paganism that says my way is right and it's anti-God. And if you don't believe it, then you're wrong. You see, I reject all of these Views that come out of naturalism because I reject naturalism because it's not about what I can see and touch. It's about what I can't see and can't feel. So I'm just going to ask you straight out. Is your trust in something tangible or intangible? Are you really believing in God or are you believing in something else? Do you walk by what you can see or do you walk by faith? That determines salvation. And that even determines how you live your Christian life if you are a believer. Now, not only do you need to understand what faith is, you need to understand, number two, what faith does. First thing it does is it answers seemingly unanswerable questions. Look at verse three. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. That is, they were, they were not made of things that are not seen. The preacher applies faith now to creation. Every conclusion 
about origination, how we got here, origins, depends on an important assumption. And the preacher's assumption is this, that the universe was rendered complete by the words of God. Literally, he spoke matter into existence. Now, that's not something people can do. They might be able to get a picture of that in some movie and, and make it look like that because of what computers can do, but you can't actually speak matter into existence. God did that. So the preacher's assumption is the universe was rendered complete by God's word. His conclusion based on that assumption is, so what I can actually see, I can see all of you, I can see the chairs, I can see the walls, I can see the lights, I can see some trees outside, they're kind of blowing in the breeze. I can see our church sign out there. I can see all of this, okay? Many other things. We could play I spy with my little eye, right? We can see. But everything I can see was not made by, made by something I can see. Because I have never seen God with my human eyes. So I can't see the thing that created the things that I can see. In fact, I can see what God created, but I can't see him. And so the preacher's explanation of origination is that it can only be understood by faith. And I'm not embarrassed about that at all. I, I'm not. I, I know that right now the prevailing worldview in naturalism says that there was this big bang. And you, you have the pesky question, well, where did all the stuff that exploded come from? That's what the evolutionists call the pesky question. What came before that? What came before that? Well, then there was this. Well, what came before that? And they have no answer. You end up in philosophy, not science. I, I, I have no, I'm not embarrassed to say it's by faith. There's a whole lot of things I do by faith. I, I live my life by faith, right? We walk by faith, not by sight. And if I'm a Christian, this is kind of what I've invested myself into. This is what I bought when I became a believer in Jesus. You cannot derive any truth about what is seen by something else that you can see. Not in a fundamental origination kind of way. Yes, I can see what God made, and I can learn more truth about his creation by seeing his creation. That's what scientists do, right? That's a good thing. But I can't actually see God from that. All, all these astronauts went into space and they came back and said, we didn't see God anywhere. It's because you don't see God in space. Not with your human eyes. He's seen by faith. So if you understand how the preacher is applying his faith to creation with this assumption that God created everything and it's rendered complete by his word so that the things I see were not made by things I see. I cannot see God, but I can see what he created and that's all by faith, then faith now provides answers to that which seems unanswerable. And there's lots of questions. How did the universe begin? Faith teaches me that. How did humanity begin? Faith teaches me that. How does humanity end? Or is there an afterlife after death? Faith teaches me that. If I really believed in evolution... I would end up a nihilist. That is, I would end up in deep depression and would probably consider life to be meaningless. Why? Because if you believe in evolution, friends, the first thing you must believe is the sun is running out. At some point, there will be no humanity. Who cares about global warming? There's not going to be any warming. Sun dies, everybody gets cold real fast, right? Do a little research. The sun is burning out. We're not going to get a brand new one. You know, one's not just going to appear behind it. Oh, another sun we didn't even know was there. If I ended up believing all of this, you know, realizing the only thing that's going to survive in this planet, if I believe this, are cockroaches. If I believe that, friends, I really, I would sink into a depression. I believe that's why a lot of people are depressed, frankly. Their hope is misplaced. It answers the question of how can anyone know anything at all? We call it epistemology. How do you know what you know? And boy, you can give yourself. Uh, philosophers have fun with this one. 
And I can just step back and say, I don't really even have to answer the question from your frame of reference because I can say this is what God has told me. How does someone determine right from wrong? Again, my faith teaches me that. What is the meaning of human history? My faith teaches me that. The answer is always faith. The creator determines the course of his creation. If you believe in a creator, then everything shifts and everything changes. Do you remember what God told Jeremiah to do? Go down to the potter's house and watch the potter make, make pots, clay pots. You ever see anybody make a clay pot? We did this in art class, school. We, we, they didn't let us do it as much as watch somebody do it, which is the worst. But here's this potter would come down and they have a wheel and they throw the piece of clay on the wheel and they get the water. They got the bowl of water and they, the wheel's now turning and they're using their hands and getting their hands wet and shaping that, you know, and then maybe pushing a little into the top, slowly making an ashtray because that's what everybody makes, right? And just slowly making an ashtray. Apparently a lot of smokers when I was growing up, you know, even though nobody I knew smoked, but everybody made ashtrays. So, because it was supposed to be a cup, but it just never worked out that way. It ended up. So the create the potter, and what has power over the clay? Does the clay have power over the potter, or does the potter have power over the clay? If you believe in creation, that God is the creator, then you must believe, like a potter, he has power over his creation, not the other way around. So I can't look at God and say, you're an unjust God, an unfair God, an immoral God, a wicked God. You're a monster God. This is what so many people who believe in a naturalist worldview have concluded. They look at my God and they say, if you really believe in the God of the Bible, then you believe in a monster. And I'm looking at you saying, no, no, no. See, you're judging God by your moral standards, which are always fluctuating. Generation to generation, culture to culture. You can't do that. He's the potter. He has power over the clay. This is what Paul tells the Romans, same illustration. And it really is a good illustration. Because where do we come from? God formed man from the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And friends, once you understand that faith answers the unanswerable questions of life, then it now provides me the answers by which I should live. This is letter B. These answers provide a basis for life Verse 2, for by it the elders obtained a good report, and the elders are the saints of the Old Testament. These are the witnesses of chapter 11. All of these people, Abel and Enoch and Noah and Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Jacob and Moses, these are all the witnesses who had this worldview that saw life through God's glasses. They obtained a good report the forefathers of present-day believers, they obtained their support because they lived their lives by their faith. They were witness to God speaks about them. They received his divine approval. See, here's what God is saying. Their testimony, their lives pointed to me so people could see me through them, and I am now saying of them. So God is now saying about them. They obtained a good report. God is actually saying to them, they did well. So I know the way to please God. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. But he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and the rewarder of them to diligently seek him. So these, even as they are witnessing about God, and their testimony is about God, through their acts of faith, building a boat, even though it's never rained, leaving home and traveling five or 600 miles away from home because God says, I will give you a land of inheritance even though you have no children. You do those things because doing them pleases God, verse six, and God looks about you and says, yes, you please me. What I'm saying is this, friends, it's quite simple. The way you live your life is faith. It's not just saving faith. I'm not just saved by faith. The just live by faith. That is, if I believe God for salvation, if that's the biggest thing, and it is the big thing, then obviously I'm going to believe God in everything, in how I have a, a marriage relationship with my wife, 
God controls that. How I have a, a, a relationship with my children, God controls that. How I have a relationship in my church, God controls that. How I deal with my neighbors, how I deal with my bread man. You know, all of these things, God controls all of them. All of them. So when I open my Bible and read, you talk too much. That's kind of how my Bible, that's how I read it, you know, those passages on the tongue. Usually I come away going, I talk too much, okay. I'm going to talk less. So I'm now, I don't talk most of the day when I'm here alone. That's, I feel like that should be the bottom line, right? When I read those verses, I say, that's how I should live. And I know I should live that way because of faith. This is, this is how the elders obtained a good report. Now, obviously, the things highlighted in this passage are the really big things, but I'm going to tell you something. God cares just as much about the big things as he does about the little things. He cares about those too. And so I look at life and I can say, this is how I should live my life. All of the actions of these people were by faith and it pleased God. And so the answers to life's questions when derived from faith produce a life pleasing to God. Years ago, there was a missionary named Hudson Taylor going to China. He was a young man. And he knew that it, missions was so different back then. and It's being reinvented all the time. In fact, it's time for another reinvention of missions. There are people talking about this. The way we spread the gospel globally. Hudson Taylor knew back then raising money for something like this was very difficult. And he knew there would be times where he would really have to trust God to provide for his needs when he didn't have money. So here he was a young man. He was living in England. And he said, you know what? I'm going to do something. I have an employer and he always forgets to pay me. He's a young man. He needs money. He's got almost nothing. I mean, that's where young people start life, right? I mean, they think that they have the, what their parents have, but they don't. They have nothing. This is how they start life. Sorry, this is how you start life. <laughs> start life with nothing. And he says, I don't have any. So he's working. I think the guy was a doctor. The doctor was absent-minded, would forget to pay him. And Hudson Taylor made this vow to the Lord. I will never say to my boss, you didn't pay me. I'll just let it go. Well, now that's, that's going to be difficult, right? Because he has bills. He's got to pay rent. He's got to buy food. Hudson Taylor said, nope, I'm not going to do any of those things. I'm not going to talk to my boss about money. I'm just going to let the Lord remind him that he owes me money. And so from now on, I'm not going to bring it up at all. And T Taylor talks about in his written remembrances, his diaries, he talks about times where his doctor boss forgot to pay him. And here's now, what do I do? Well, I told the Lord, I'm not going to, I'm not going to bring it up. I'm just going to let it be. And so he go to the Lord and say, okay, Lord, I don't have enough money to buy food this week. I have no idea how I'm going to eat. I need you to provide. And do you know what T Hudson Taylor found out? Here he is deciding. I, I need to learn now as a young man to live a life of faith. If I'm going to go to China and I'm going to be a missionary and I'm going to go through a lot of hardship. I got to learn now. Do you know what he found out? God always took care of him. Usually it would go something like this. Oh, Hudson, I forgot to pay you. God would just bring it to the mind of this man. Good man. Just absent minded. And God would provide for him. That's a person who can see what is unseen. That's faith. It's a trust, a conviction. I firmly believe this. And because of it, here's what it does. It answers all of my questions about life. Let's pray.